This is lesson 1.3 and today we're going to be talking about measuring devices and unit prefixes. Our goal is to understand uncertainty in measuring devices and to learn how to use the metric unit prefixes. So let's start off talking about the different types of measuring devices that we're going to be using commonly and first of all balances are fairly easy. Balances report the mass in the correct number of significant figures typically, and that means that the last digit that you're going to see in your balance, so for example, on this balance, you've got 0 0.0000, that last zero is uncertain, so you can just write down whatever the mass that the balance reports, and that should be reported to the correct number of significant figures automatically. If there's a zero at the end, make sure you write that zero because it is significant. There are a lot of things around the lab that we can use to measure volumes of liquids, but we shouldn't use all of them. For example, the Erlenmeyer flask, which is also known as a conical flask, they are used because they are easy to mix by hand. They should not be used for measuring volumes. And if you do happen to use it for measuring volumes, you're going to have 10% error or more, which means that your volume is going to have only one or two significant figures. Beakers are designed for mixing and chemical reactions. They also should not be used for measuring volumes, and if they are, they will typically have 5% error or more in the measurement, which means that you cannot report any more than two significant figures. Now, a lot of students at this point typically ask me, well, why in the world do you have all of these markings on the side if they shouldn't be used for measuring volumes? And the reason for that is these are only as a reference so that you know the approximate volume, whether it's a chemical reaction or you're simply mixing things in there. They're not to be used for actually the volume measurement, but only as a reference. So what should you use to measure volumes? Well, you can use a graduated cylinder. These are specifically designed for measuring volumes and they should not be used for mixing or any kind of chemical reactions. The error involved in these things is typically between 0.1 and 1% of the max volume, which means that you will be able to get about three significant figures for your measurement when you use a graduated cylinder to measure volume. Now, what is the difference? There's a bunch of things that's different in this. One of them is the shape. The shape allows you to get a lot more precision when you're measuring where that volume is. And the second thing is that these are typically calibrated. Beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks just have volume measurements written on the side, and they typically aren't calibrated. That is, they typically aren't measured for exactly how much volume they hold. You just have the volume approximately printed on the side. Graduated cylinders, however, should all be calibrated, which means that somebody's going to come and put in a certain volume here, a certain volume here, and they're going to use that to determine exactly where to print these numbers so that these numbers are printed based on the volume inside that graduated cylinder. When using a graduated cylinder to measure out the volume, always use the smallest possible graduated cylinder to measure out the liquid once. This is going to help to minimize the error of your volume measurement. So let's practice this a little bit. If you were by chance needing to measure an 8.5 milliliter volume, 31 milliliter volume, and a 15 milliliter volume, which different graduated cylinder would you choose? For the 8.5 milliliter volume, you're going to want to use that smallest possible graduated cylinder that you can do the measurement once in. That is this 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. What about 31 milliliters? That's right, the 100 milliliter is the best. Although it's closest to 25 milliliters, the 25 milliliter graduated cylinder would cause you to need to do two volume measurements rather than one. And so it's preferable to use the 100 milliliter graduated cylinder rather than 25 milliliter. Last of all, if you want to measure 15 milliliters, you of course are going to choose that 25 milliliter graduated cylinder. Volumetric flasks are designed for measuring one specific volume very accurately. Typically, the error is going to be less than 0.1%, which means that your volume measurement should have about four significant figures. These are very good to use if you have an exact volume that you want to measure, but you're not going to be able to get a range of different volumes like you will with the graduated cylinders. 
The reason these are so accurate is that they can contain large volumes down here in the bulb, but in their narrow neck here, a little bit of a difference in volume is going to make a big difference up or down. And so they are calibrated very accurately to that one specific volume that they are designed to measure. A meniscus usually forms at the top of the water or liquid that you're measuring because water is more attracted to glass than to itself. A meniscus typically has a U shape like in this diagram right over here where the liquid or water is climbing up on the sides of its container like this and like this. It's going to depend on the material of the container and on the liquid that you're measuring, but it's quite common for this to happen for a lot of different liquids. When measuring a liquid, set the graduated cylinder on a flat surface and line your eye up with the top of the liquid. Never ever hold the graduated cylinder or measuring container with your hand when you're measuring the volume. You will always get a terrible measurement if you do that. Make sure that you don't look down or up at the volume because that's going to get you a poor measurement also. Instead, make sure that you line your eye up with the top of the liquid so that you can get an accurate reading of those numbers. Also, read the volume from the bottom of the meniscus. The last digit should be the one that is unsure. So make sure that when your eyes lined up here, that you are reading that volume measurement from the very bottom of the meniscus, not the top. It can be tempting sometimes to look at that top measurement, or maybe you might get fancy and try to look at somewhere in the middle. Don't do that. These measuring devices are always designed for you to measure the liquid from the bottom of the meniscus, and that's going to get you the most accurate measurement every single time. Also, I find that students tend to not write down enough digits. That very last digit of the volume needs to be somehow estimated or guessed. If you know that number exactly, that means you're probably not writing down enough significant figures. Let's try a couple examples to show you how this works. Look at this volume and see if you can get the measurement. There are a couple tricky things to this. First of all, you need to figure out where exactly the 20 and the 25 are. Secondly, you need to figure out what each of those notches means. And thirdly, you need to be able to figure out exactly how many digits to write down. So let's look at this and what do you think? If you said something like 21.6, you're correct. Maybe 21.5, 21.7, but something in that range. If you simply said 21 or 22, that's not enough information. You need to have three significant figures for this calculation. Now, let's see how this works. First of all, this 20 milliliters right here is this long line right here, and this 25 is this long line right here. And what does that mean? That means that each of these notches here is only going up a half. And so this is 20.5, this is 21, this is 21.5, this is 22, this is 23, this is 24, this is 25. All right, so back over here, this is 21.5 right here. And we notice that this volume measurement, if we measure from the bottom of the meniscus, is ever so slightly above this 21.5. So I'm going to go ahead and write 21.6 down. And that's the best measurement for this volume. Go ahead and try the same thing out with this volume. What do you think the volume of the water in this graduated cylinder is? As you're doing your measurement, you might want to pause this video. Also notice how big this meniscus is. If you measured from the bottom or the top, that's a huge difference in volume measurements that you might make. So make sure you don't measure from the top, don't measure from the middle, always measure from the bottom of the meniscus right down here. All right, so what is it? What do you think? If you said 6.64 or 6.63, 6.65, or in that range, you are correct. This one's a little bit trickier. What's going on? This line down here is six. This is eight, which means this line right here must be seven, which means each of these notches is not one, but two. So this right here is 6.2. This is 6.4. And this is 6.6. This is 6.8. Okay. So this is between 6.4 and 6.8, but we're also 100% sure that this is significantly lower than 6.7. So we know this is between 6.6 .6 and 6.7. And at this point in time, you're gonna kind of estimate, all right, well, which is it closer to? It looks a little bit closer to 6.6 .6 than to 6.7, but it's kind of in the middle between 6.6 .6 and 6.7.
So I'm going to say 6.64. Remember, this is 6.6 .6 and this is 6.8 up here. Next, I want you guys to learn these different metric unit prefixes. This is not all of the metric unit prefixes. There's a lot more than this, but these are the most common ones. Okay, and so what do you actually need to learn? Please memorize the prefix, the abbreviation, and the multiplier. So that's going to be these first three columns right here. So what do I mean? That means that if I talk about mega something, you're going to need to know that mega is this capital M right here. And it means whatever that number is times 10 to the six. Or if I talk about nano something, that's going to be N and it's going to be something times 10 to the negative ninth. Okay, so you're going to need to be able to use these and know all of those different abbreviations and multipliers. So take some time to memorize those. I'm going to go ahead and go over a few examples right now. All right, 72 milliliters. What exactly does that mean? If you're given something with a metric prefix and your metric units, you can convert that into regular notation fairly simply. All you need to do is know that this M here, this lowercase M means milli, which means times 10 to the negative three. So that's going to be 72 times 10 to the minus three. This prefix specifically means times 10 to the minus three. And that's all you need to do. If you wanted to convert this into regular notation, this is 72 times 10 to the minus three. So all you need to do is you need to take this decimal point and move it three spots to the left. We move it to the left to make it a smaller number because this is a negative exponent right here. And that's going to be 0 0.072 liters. Now, what if you want to go the other direction? What if you want to go from the number to some kind of prefix format? How do you do that? Let's go through a few examples of that. Here, we have some number in scientific notation. We've got 7.75 times 10 to the minus seventh grams. However, unfortunately, there is no times 10 to the minus seventh in terms of unit prefixes. If you look on the table or if you've memorized them, there is a times 10 to the minus six and a times 10 to the minus nine, but there's no times 10 to the minus seven. So what do we actually do here? Well, let's think about that. You could convert this into something times 10 to the minus six, like you did here, or something times 10 to the minus nine, like we did here. Which are we going to choose? Well, it turns out that when you convert to prefix format, you should always choose the closest prefix that is smaller than the number you're dealing with. And so in that case, we're definitely not going to go with times 10 to the minus six because that's bigger than times 10 to the minus seven. Instead, we're going to choose times 10 to the minus nine. What's the rationale here? We want some number that is larger than one. So up here, this 0.775 times 10 to the minus six is smaller than one. So that's not what we want. We want to get some number that's larger than one. In the end of the day, we're typically going to get numbers here that are between one and a thousand. So the number should be greater than one, but less than a thousand. If it's greater than a thousand, you're always going to have another different unit prefix that you can use for that. So this number is 775 times 10 to the minus nine grams, which is 775 nanograms. Remember, 10 to the minus nine is nano. Let's try one more example here. What about this? This is 10,000 grams. What's the best way to put this into prefix format? So let's first go ahead and put this into scientific notation. That's going to be one times 10 to the fourth. Our decimal point is right here and we move it one, two, three, four spots to the left. So that's one times 10 to the fourth grams. And then we think to ourselves, well, should we use the 10 to the third or the 10 to the six as our multiplier? And of course, we're going to choose the multiplier that is smaller than 10 to the fourth. And that multiplier is 10 to the third. So how do we convert this into 10 to the third? That's right. If this number gets smaller, right, because we're going to make this go down to 10 to the third, this number over here needs to get bigger. So this is going down by a factor of 10 to 10 to the third. So this needs to increase by a factor of 10. And that's going to be equal to 10 times 10 to the third grams. Notice that these two numbers are equal. One times 10 to the fourth is equal to 10 times 10 to the third. And so 10 to the third is kilo. And so this is simply 10 kilograms. One last example. 
0.0004 meters. What in the world is that? Well, let's first convert that into scientific notation. Move that decimal point one, two, three, four spots to the right. So that's four times 10 to the minus fourth meters. And there is no unit prefix for 10 to the minus fourth. So we can use either 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus third. Which one is smaller than 10 to the minus fourth? That's right, 10 to the minus six. So we want to convert this somehow to something times 10 to the minus six. 10 to the minus six is 100 times smaller than this. So we need to increase this by 100 fold. So as we decrease this by 100 fold, this is going to increase by 100 fold. And so that's going to be 400 times 10 to the minus six. Well, 10 to the minus six, we already know that is micro and micro has this abbreviation that kind of looks like a U and that's going to be 400 micrometers. All right, and just as a little aside, practice drawing this. This one is a little bit strange. It's actually not a U, it's the Greek mu. And the way you're gonna write that is you're going to first write this tail and then you're gonna draw a U like that. So that's how we're gonna draw our micro or this Greek mu here. This is 400 micrometers. All right, that's it for today. Have a great rest of your day. Stay curious and get working on that homework. See ya.